My grandmother was a midwife. A lot of people were born with my grandmother's the midwife, and she also used herbal remedies. She used to teach me about the herbal remedies, and I learned from my father how to harvest the leaves for making herbal remedies that my grandmother used to make, and she was a midwife as well. Small farmer. This is kupasu. Kupasu. We can make it fruit juice, candy, jams, and bonbons. And if you roast, and it's like cocoa or cacao, it's a kupasu is similar to cacao. And this here, if you're ill, it's good for your blood to strengthen your blood to give you strength. It's strong. And jatoba, this is a jatoba tea. This here is copaiba. It's still a young uh, sapling. Copaiba. This is Espinheira Santa. Uh, it was the bats that spread the seeds for the uh, Espinheira Santa. This is Jatobá. And you, in August, you harvest the sap. And you let the sap trickle down and harvest it. It depends. About 10 or 15 days later, you collect the sap. This here is mangu. This is a herbal remedy for toothache and infections. This here is a herbal remedy. Jetchikia is for chronic anemia. You take this as the remedy, and you take the uh, this uh, gives a lot of strength, a pick and picker upper, so to speak. I never attended school. This proves that nature teaches us how to leave, just like the elders. The elders, the forest, the forest gives us everything. The Ministry of the Tourism and the Casa Azul Association are now presenting the 19th FLIP, the Parati International Literary Festival, a project that benefits from a federal law for cultural incentives and Vadi culture. Official sponsorship from Itaú Bank and the Vali Cultural Institute. The FLIP is organized by Casa Azul Association, the Special Secretary for Culture under the Ministry of Tourism. Nere Gera in Guarani, it means where the spirits bathe in the forest. Literature and plants, naturalism and violence, leaves and verbs, plants and healing, fungi, technobotanies, threads of words, utopia and dystopia. This roundtable is live, broadcast in three internet channels, the original audio, Portuguese, and English. Please choose on the lower right toolbar the language of your preference. You can send questions to the authors through the chat box on YouTube. At the end, some of the questions will be addressed to the speakers. Hello, good afternoon. Here we are for a round of conversation on plants and healing in multiple dimensions. And in this round of conversation, we're going to join together here with Monica Gagliano. 
She's an ecologist from Italy, the author of various different books on plant cognition, including Thus Spoke the Plant, and Jean Paulo Lima Bajeto, an indigenous leader and anthropologist. He created the Center for Indigenous Medicine in Manaus, and he's going to tell us how to pronounce Vasilikovi. If I got the pronunciation wrong, Jean Paulo will correct me. We'll also have we were supposed to have Silva Net Lerman, a grassroots educator and community health expert and a healer, but something came up and Silva Net was unable to join us for this round table and we'll join with her soon, we hope. And I'm Monica Nogueira. I'm an anthropologist, a professor in Brasilia and dedicated to research and collaborative action with traditional communities and peoples. Okay, this activity is part of the FLIP 2021 program, and which is an addition. It's different from various different aspects. The event this year, it was conceived by a collective of curators and is called suggestively a curatorial forest. So these are curators men and women who are sensitive to the exceptional moment that we're experiencing in place of choosing a tribute to a specific author, we have proposed a central theme for the debate. So the program focuses on a theme as the taste of Paulo Freire, a theme, a word that generates everything. And the perspective presiding this program is that literature should help us to think and conceive the world or to glimpse worlds in the world, paraphrasing Caetano Veloso. So, and a theme which is challenging is the present time, which calls on us to radically change our perspectives with not only thinking, but in practice, the generating word, the inspiring word for FLIP in 2021 is Nyedi in Guarani. It's the way that the Guarani people call the Atlantic forest for the pluriverse, which constitutes it, that constitutes all forests and each and every one of them. So we're here convened and and it's an effort to appreciate and give visibility to the diversity of life forms and reiterate that there's a correspondence, epistemological correspondence in the forms of knowledge, uh, life's diversity and a correspondence and ontological correspondence in the ways of being in the world and realities which coexist and are experienced by different beings both human and non-human. But for this exercise, we're gonna focus on the plant world and our interactions with plants. And that's why we're meeting today, Monica Gagliano. There were uh, namesakes, I'm in Brazil and she's in Australia and Jean Paulo Bajeto is in Manaus. And it's the result of a inter-ethnic meeting between the Tucano and I forgot the name, Jean Paulo, of the other nation, Tuyuca. Is that correct? Help me, Tucano. You're Tucano from the Tucano nation, and there's an inter-ethnic meeting of different indigenous peoples. Oh, oh, I see your parents, right? Okay, you're the result of the inter-ethnic. Your mother is Tuyuka, right? And your father's Tucano, okay. This called my attention because that's what we're talking about to be able to establish dialogicity with life in all its dimensions. And so that's why we're meeting today. We're gonna to focus on the plant world and our interactions with plants and accompanying a movement which has traversed the world and permeated the world in the field of sciences, we realize that there is a change, although slow, 
in the way that plants have been perceived. So there are studies, recent studies in the fields of ecology and earth sciences as well, that just shown that plants send signals to each other and whether through their roots or emitting chemical elements in the air. And in other words, they transmit a variety of information which can be to call attention to a predator or indicate uh, proximity of water. And in social sciences and human sciences, we also see something similar progress in plant studies and studies related to the plants rights and interaction with plants, interactions between humans and plants and the ontology of plants, the aesthetic representations of plants in literature, but also in cinema, in arts. So there are new approaches which are emerging in the field of sciences and which uh, give us a distance with from the conventional wisdom of plants as being as beings like from lower levels in the great grand chain of beings is that a lower rungs but this inflection that we've been witnessing in science has highlighted the degree to which plants are essential for life because they give us our sustenance because they offer us possibilities for healing there are studies also that highlight the plant's intelligence, their sociability, and their language, and even their uh, politics. I'm saying politics here to refer precisely to a practice in politics performed in network format and collaboration and horizontally. These are also studies that emphasize the importance and the role that plants have and that they can play in confronting the impasses that we have in front of us in the world today. But long before sciences, traditional systems of knowledge of the indigenous peoples and the Quilombola peoples, traditional communities, various different traditional communities. And here are there numerous different uh, traditional healers, uh, coconut breakers, uh, extractivists in the Amazon. And this is a problem for translation, but there's a wide diversity of like nut gathers and traditional communities which have huge knowledge on plants and their uses and which have a perspective, a very different perspective towards these beings which only now science, is, science has reached long before we witnessed this gradual turning point in sciences. We already witnessed critical manifestations, observed critical manifestations from the traditional peoples and communities here in Brazil against this anthropocentric paradigm placing humans, humankind, humanity, at the center, which uh, presides over and dominates science and, uh, and Western thinking to a major extent. And that is why, by no coincidence, one of the rallying cries for the last march of indigenous women in 2021 here in Brasilia was deforest mines to cure, uh, reforest rather, reforest mines to heal the earth, reforest mines to heal the earth. This was in the indigenous women's march in Brasilia here in early 2021. So this matter is demonoculturaling thinking as Vandana Shiva says. So this is gonna be our exercise here and we're gonna uh, weave disciplines. Jean Paul is an anthropologist Monica Gagliano is an ecologist. We're also going to weave systems of knowledge and intertwine them, interweave them, because Jean Paul is going to talk about his perspective as an indigenous anthropologist participating in another language and 
knowledge system in science and interscientificity, since Jean-Paul is also a founder of a Center for Indigenous Medicine in Manaus, and with Monica Galliano, all the result of the research efforts that Monica Galliano has done for disseminating approach which acknowledges the cognition between plants. So we're going to be here exercising in multiple ways, the dialogue and the mixture and the proximity and different perspectives for us to be able to reforest minds and hearts to heal the earth as the indigenous women have urged us to do. So how are we gonna do this? I think that I'll turn the floor over to Jean Paulo first for him to tell us his story about the work that he's been developing at the Center for Indigenous Medicine in Manaus. And Jean Paulo recently defended, uh, presented his PhD dissertation focusing on the issues of the body and how it is constituted in his people and the connections between the body with everything around it. So I think that Jean Paul, you can speak now for us to continue with this conversation. Uh, hello. He's speaking in the Tukan language. Good evening, everyone, one and all. It's a huge pleasure to be here in this round table at this moment and in this event, which is so important, FLIP. And I want to thank the entire team at FLIP, and I want to thank the team of the curators with their wonderful work. And here we're here to share our ideas and who knows, perhaps build or better reforest mines. I am an indigenous from the upper Rio Negro, and I have an experience in the in academia is a struggle. The Center for Indigenous Medicine is a concrete manifestation of our struggle. But I'm going to situate now first, basically, why we created the Center for Indigenous Medicine in Manaus. So we indigenous peoples in the upper Rio Negro, we organize this, this world that we live in. We organize it when our conception of our how we build this world, we build our world and through the work by an architect whom we call Pawan. And in this construction by the creator, Pawan, we also have a notion of organization by domains, the domain, the aerial domain, the forest and land domain, and the aquatic domain. Each domain, air, land, forest, and water is inhabited by humans under other conditions and other domains called spirits, but they're not spirits. They're humans, they're not spirits. They care for all the elements in their own surroundings. And by the beings, when I say being, I'm talking about animals, other elements, as we understand them. So the forest is part of the domain, the land forest domain. So to talk about forest, the forest for us is to talk about the notion of home, a house. The forest is a home because in the home, the house inhabit humanoids, the ones that we call kurupiras, various different types of humanoids who inhabit the forest we call kurupira, there are beings, animals of all types. And I call attention to when we fell a tree, we are killing separate types of animals which inhabit and make their homes in this tree. Just imagine destroying kilometers on end of forest. We're destroying many homes of these beings. This, after which we also have 
the forest, the domain, is the home of the Oaimasan. In other words, the humans, where the Yanomami is called, I mean, Shapiri. Our people are, use other names. This notion for us is fundamental because it is directly related to the construction of quality of life and health. And the forest also in our conception of the upper Rio Negro is the clothing of the earth. My father taught me that when the earth was built on a platform, they placed earth on the platform. When it was just the earth, the earth felt like a naked person. The earth needed clothing. So the, the demiurge placed the forest there as clothing to cover the earth. So this is in my PhD dissertation called Why Masin, uh, Human Beings in Our Language. And the most important thing is that the forest is healing. We call it katiro. In other words, in Guarani, the speaking Guarani, called Nieri. Nieri is where the spirits bathe. I was talking with the uh, Carlos Papa. The meaning is the same, that it's life. What does Ikikatiro mean? What does it mean? It's that considering all of these things and the aspects that I mentioned, plus the question of the elements of healing, elements that uh, perform healing. So we have medicinal herbs of all types for all ills. Hence the reason that we have biomedicine. If we drink of this knowledge, indigenous knowledge, or the quilombola knowledge to produce herbal remedies, but many things, we haven't said everything. Who knows, may one day we will. And as I say, to know the qualities of the plants for a specialist, an indigenous specialist, but a healer or page is essential. Quality of the plants, the sweet, the bitter, the plants, and the texture, and all of this is part of the system of knowledge, which is essential where these qualities which are activated for healing diseases. I always give a simple example. When a person is healed from a wound, an injury, a specialist activates exactly the quality of, for uh, stringent qualities. He has to know all of the plants that have the stringent quality. Otherwise, you can't activate these stringent qualities. Turning a glass of water into uh, like methylate, making a and base um, which is called blessings, healing blessings, is not to pray the uh, our Father who art in heaven. No, or the. Psalm 23, this power, of the specialists that they have for their background of activating these qualities on the form of metachemical manipulation of things. Hence, it a, becomes a remedy. Otherwise, a pharmacist or will manipulate chemically the things, but we, not us. We don't need to manipulate them chemically. We need only need to do chemical manipulation through words. So the word for us is not something invisible or something intangible. It is an object. The word is an object. Just as a scalpel for a surgeon is important. The word for us, my father, who is a specialist, has taught me it's the scalpel. The word is the scalpel for us. It cuts, it cleans, it heals. And heals ills and wounds. In this sense, the Center for Indigenous Medicine is part of this logic. It's within this logic, in this context, conceptual context, which operates in 
acts and intervenes on the body. Hence, I bring in my dissertation the idea of body. When I began to do my PhD, I was restless because I was tired of hearing the blah, blah, blah of blessers and healers, prayer healers and uh, the sacred, the spirit, blah, blah, blah. All these words, they sound simple, words to the wind. When you treat them as something so natural when we pronounce them. But for us, these blah, 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 it was very, uh, took a high price. It was the decimation of our language because the lack of faith, we were massacred because of the lack of writing, we were massacred because we didn't know how to pray that we were discriminated against. So to deconstruct, that's why I bring the idea of the body from the indigenous point of view, but in a very simple situation, a physician, for example, is not gonna be able to cut the body rather or medicate someone if it doesn't know minimally what the body is. There's no logic to it. To be a physician, he has to know what it is. Health, disease, the body, and medicines, etc. for an MD. So I ask, so what is the concept that the indigenous peoples from the upper Rio Negro have to intervene for good? So I bring in my dissertation this issue, which is the body, which is constituted from six elements. And here we have the text, the brief text in the book. It was published based on this. So, and this was the basis for my father, my uncle, and other, my uncle Duvalin, who treat and care for people based on this notion that I've just discussed using especially three, rather two techniques to care for health, namely basese and herbal remedies. Basese, to understand, it's like other people translated as blessing. A lot of people think that to manipulate herbal remedies, all you have to do is take it and make tea. That's It's not all that simple. I suspected when someone said that plant is good for X, Y, or Z. That's, they say, oh, that plant is good for this, that, or the other. Another thing is to produce the remedy based on that plant. It's another thing entirely. It involves another logic. First, you have to adopt certain behaviors. If you're a woman, for example, you don't have, can't be menstruating. Menstruation for us uh, eliminates the effect. It contaminates the remedy. She has to be on a diet. Not, uh, eat fatty fish or fried foods and the weather, the time, the mixture. So all of these labels, behavioral labels produce the remedy. So a lot of people get confused and mix these things up. So when we talk about plants that heal, we're talking about this dimension, so complex dimension, thus, the Center for Indigenous Medicine has accumulated experience for four of uh, four years. Around 4,950 people have visited and studied. 99% of these are non-Indigenous people who have spent time there, they have spent time there and have spent time there. Thus, the issue of us engaging in dialogue, in other words, Biomedicine is extremely important for us, but biomedicine, it is also at the its limit. It's reached its limit. The biomedicine also served our knowledge as non-knowledge, as non-science. Also, always has always seen our medicine as non-science. What I'm saying here is that our medicine is has been used for 14,000 years, not 522 years since Brazil was so-called discovered. Biomedicine came to Brazil in 1500. We have been here 
on the land, on the forest, and managing the cosmos in relation to our cosmopolitics. And we've developed technologies and we've developed medicine for 14,000 years. Therefore, it's contradictory to think that indigenous peoples don't have a medicine. It's a contradiction in terms in talking about our central theme now, which is to bring this debate in this event that's so important to talk about vegetation, the plant body. And I think, and I see that as well, as Monica said so appropriately, society in general begins to realize that we have reached the limit. Thus, the importance of producing literature, the importance of writing, and for us to produce writing. My colleagues and co-workers are like Evandro, Pedro, Hermano, and Ana, and the people, and Mauro himself, the great writers. But something that called my attention was when I was thinking of this about writing and the curatorship, I said, is it a lot of fiction that occurred to me to write, thinking, and so forth? No. Afterwards, I thought to myself and analyzed and talking to my father, we discovered something that it, from my, from the point of view of my father, translating, I can say the following, translating it into Portuguese literature is not a fiction. It is communication that we establish with which we people that we do not communicate with verbally. In other words, it is a cosmopolitical mediation. Thank you very much. Oh, Paul, thank you very much. Okay, I think that we could hear Monica Gagliano now for her, uh, her to tell us about her experience in the laboratory with Stefano Mancuso for the audience here this experience in developing research concerning plant cognition and what kind of thinking is this that the plants have for us to continue in this round of conversation. So please, Monica Cagliano. Thank you. Thank you for having me and so beautiful to be here. And I apologize that I do not speak Portuguese. I would really love to. <laughs> because I really like the sound, but unfortunately, uh, no, I don't have enough Portuguese to be able to have a conversation. Uh, so I'm very grateful that there is a live translation for me to follow the conversation anyway. And um, I would also like to acknowledge that I am on Banjalan country. Uh, this is the Northern River region of Australia in New South Wales. And this land, uh, was never ceased and is always been and it will always be, um, you know, of the indigenous people. Um, I, I would like to also clarify another thing in regards to my own work. Uh, I did not work, I do not work for Stefano Mancuso. I'm not his student or any, any of the such. Uh, we collaborated on one project which I had initiated. And so um, I, you know, I had my own, I have my own research and my own work and uh, I would like to uh, clarify that. I am not, uh, you know, part of his uh, entourage. <laughs> um, aside from that, which is just triviality really, uh, thank you so much, Joe Paolo. I really enjoyed your sharing. And of course, Monica as well for your introduction. Um, the thing that uh, really captured my attention, I guess, is uh, how my work as a scientist has changed and twisted and turned and, and then really found its way in a place that I feel is the only place for science to go ahead. It's the only place where science is really gonna be, Western science is really gonna be useful. And, uh, and this place is much closer and much more in line with uh, 
the way many indigenous people think and understand and um, gather their wisdom from uh, and in collaboration with uh, the natural world, if we want to call it that way. And um, so I was trained, uh, as many other scientists, I was uh, trained, duly trained, uh, to, to, you know, to follow certain rules. Uh, but those rules, um, while they seem to fit with a particular paradigm, which is the same paradigm, actually, that has come to country like Brazil, but also here in Australia and everywhere, uh, and has really caused a lot of damage, not just to the natural environment and to the people who were already there, but also long-term um, long -term damage that we are seeing the impacts now. And I think that this is why we are having this uh, big uh, environmental global crisis. <laughs> uh, this is the legacy of the colonial approach, the imperial approach, it just changed uh, name over time, but it's the same story over and over. And uh, so I particularly appreciate um, hearing and learning from what the indigenous people of different areas of the world have to share. And it seems that this is such an important time to be able to hear that wisdom. And, uh, and it has uh, empowered, listening to that wisdom has empowered, I feel, my own science because he has transformed me first. And then the science that I end up doing, which of course to most of my colleagues looks weird, uh, but to me, it feels in perfect alignment and, and in a strange way, I find myself, uh, I don't belong to either world. I'm not indigenous as such, and I'm not uh, the, the same scientist that it was, uh, that was duly trained and certified as a particular, in a particular way. And yet I think that maybe this is exactly what the world is requiring now, a bridging of these two bodies of knowledge and a sharing of wisdom because science, of course, Western science, of course, has a lot to share as well. Um, but um, in a way it has decided that by a priori knowing everything, uh, it's not listening anymore, it's not learning anymore. And so it's shutting down other bodies of knowledge which could enrich it. And, and so in that sense, in my experience, this is how I got to study plants. Uh, I'm a, a marine scientist by training. I worked with fish for much of my early career. And yet the same questions that I was interested in when I was looking at the animals in the ocean uh, are really the same question that I brought into the field of plants. And as I said, not being a plant biologist or plant physiologist, I really don't know plants in that way. And as I started working with plants, I refused to to be indoctrinated in knowing them that way. I wanted to have the space and the freedom to um, knowing otherwise. And, um, and in that sense, uh, my experiences with indigenous people of different places has really helped because it has shown me that it is possible to know them otherwise. And this knowledge is not only um, enriching, as I already said, but it's extraordinary. It has uh, changed me as the human being and in a way it has freed me as a human being to be able to think more widely and, and connect deeper with the very nature of who I am or who we all are. And uh, through the example of others, in this case, the plants and how um, by in collaboration with these other beings, um, you can really learn a little bit more of what this being is, the human being. And, uh, and this is, as Giampaolo pointed out, is like uh, the body is really important because at least in, in my experience, a lot of people, um, when I have, especially at the beginning when I was speaking about my work, a lot of people felt that uh, some of it was too esoterical or too new age or too hippie or whatever label they wanted to give it. And which is in a way the same experience of, uh, uh, you know, many indigenous people having to be told that their knowledge and their beliefs are childish or, you know, that same patronizing is the same, again, is the same colonial patronizing attitude. And, um, 
but in fact, I, uh, what I learned and, uh, and I realized that that was my, that was the place where I needed to focus. It was like the body, the body means grounding. It means like, this is no fanciful stuff. This is uh, a layer of reality that is being sliced off by the conventional wisdom dictated by a quite domineering techno-scientific approach. Uh, but uh, that's only to our own loss. And as I said, again, it's like, uh, and we're seeing the results of that loss, that we are about to lose everything because of that. So I feel that um, returning to the body and connecting with the materiality of what we are made of, which is the same that makes everything else. And then this uh, kinship and this feeling of inter deep interconnectedness, it becomes really obvious. And, what, and I guess that's why as well for, for many indigenous people, these kind of, what I'm saying is nothing new. <laughs> they already know all of this and it's like, yeah, yeah, of course. But for, uh, from a scientific perspective and from a Western model perspective, this stuff sounds revolutionary. It's not revolutionary at all, but um, it needs to be spoken, I think, so that it can be reawakened in that part of, of humanity that has forgotten uh, who we are. And, uh, and of course, the, the medicine, you know, the, the cura, <laughs> Uh, for this is um, the, the interaction and the re direct relationship with these others. And, um, and of course, uh, as pa Sergio Paolo mentioned, uh, the voice, the words and the sound and uh, much of my work has focused on that and much of my uh, upcoming work, uh, the project that I'm envisioning as my next um, dimension, uh, is focusing deeply on the, the role of sound. And, and in a way, it is an, an incantation. It is a, a form of blessing, uh, if that's what the Western paradigm wants to call it. But uh, I am actually um, listening to you, Gio Paolo, really helped me to uh, feel what it is that I'm trying to do with the sound uh, to, in order to use the sound of the nature itself to regenerate nature itself, including, of course, and primarily the human, which is the one that needs most of the regeneration and uh, the human mind and the human heart. And, and, um, and it was interesting because, uh, yeah, as I was listening to you, I realized that, yeah, this is, we are making magic again. We have to make this incantation but it shouldn't be mistaken as something childish or otherworldly. No, no, it belongs to this world. It's just that we refuse to see it. And fortunately, I'm always so grateful that um, there are people like you that still remember very clearly and the tradition and the lineage is so strong despite everything that has happened that it gives great, I wouldn't want to call it hope. I think it's trust that there is a way to, to, to use the situation that we have at hand to transcend this limited mind and, uh, and reopen ourselves to actually reality, act, the actual world around us uh, and reconnect with that and collaborate with that. So yeah, so thank you. I'm very grateful for this conversation. In your work, Monica, you tell us about memory, the plant's memory, right? Explain this to us. How do plants remember? What can we learn when we observe plants? And what can we learn, what can we learn about memory? This is something that called my attention. It's something that other people that are watching and listening they would like to hear more about the plant's memory. How does that work? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, well, uh, memory is part of the cognitive realm, basically. And uh, without memory, uh, you can learn. And without learning, uh, you can't be here. And it doesn't really matter whether you're a plant or a human being or a fish like learning is part of the process of being here, being life. Um, 
I started looking at memory implants because of some of the experiences that I had in my own personal exploration, especially in, at the beginning in Peru and then in other places where I learned that uh, plants had a lot of um, information and wisdom to share. And, and the realization that there were an ancestral memory stored in, in these other beings because they've been here for much, much longer than we have. And so I thought like, wow, if I can remember this history of this planet, surely they can remember what happened yesterday. <laughs> And uh, so what my attempt was to see whether the, the Western scientific tools could be used to, to test for this. And, um, and so one of the experiments that I did was with the famous Mimosa pudica, who is the, also known as the sensitive plant. I know that you have it in Brazil because it's a plant that uh, grows in many tropical areas. And, um, and this plant is uh, perfect for this kind of um, connecting and opening uh, of minds because uh, it's a plant that moves at our same human time scale. So we can appreciate that the plant is doing something just because it's actually moving. That's what we are focusing on movement at a time scale that we can observe. And so Mimosa was a good entry point, it was a good bridge. And, uh, and what I did is uh, a very basic level of learning. I tested for what we call habituation. And basically, habituation is the same thing that you do when, if you are in a room, say even now, and there is a noise in the background. And at the beginning, you can hear the noise and your, your mind is focusing on that, on that noise because it's trying to work out whether it needs to do something about it or not. But after a while, when nothing happens, say the hum of the refrigerator you know that is just the hum of the refrigerator or the buzzing of a light you know that is just nothing and so suddenly you cut it out of your environment you're not listening to it anymore you're not paying attention to it anymore but if suddenly there was an explosion near your refrigerator or near that buzzing light then your your attention would be ready to go so is this ignoring something, the ability to learn through experience is something that might look like uh, should be of concern through experience you learn that actually is, is nothing to be worried about. And it's kind of like a selective learning, a selective memory. So this is what the plant was able to do. Mimosa was able to learn to ignore a disturbance. In that case, it was me disturbing the plant by dropping it. Uh, it was a controlled drop. And as I say often, there were no plants hurt in the process of this experimentation. Everyone survived and everyone was happy. But um, if you, yeah, it, it, the plants within a couple of seconds is able to realize, oh, actually, this is nothing. You know, it's annoying, but uh, nothing happened after this. I don't die and no, nobody's eating me. And so the plant, which closes the naturally closes the leaves when it's disturbed, starts reopening the leaves, even while I'm still dropping her. And then it just completely ignores me. So it doesn't try to protect itself or defend itself from this disturbance because it has understood that this disturbance actually doesn't mean anything. And when I left it alone for a while and then came back to it and did it again, and this was over a month, the plant uh, still remember exactly what that experience was. And so it knew immediately, it didn't even pretend to protect itself. It was like, I know this, uh, we already been here. So that was the first real evidence of a plant able to learn, indiv the individual plants be able to learn from their own individual experiences and then use that experience later, a month later. And just uh, as, a, as a reference point, Bees, which are really amazing, have a much shorter memory span than a plant. So just to put it into, into context. And then, of course, I didn't stop there. And I looked at higher level of learning. And I, I used the same model that we, is, we are familiar with. And it's called uh, the Pavlovian learning. And it was made famous by Pavlov with his dog. And Pavlov was ringing this bell. And the dog... Um, the, didn't care less about the bell, but he learned over time and experience, repeated experience that the bell always rang before dinner was coming. 
And so though at the beginning, the bell didn't mean much. Uh, after a few times of iteration of bell, dinner, bell, dinner, the dog learned that, oh, the bell means that dinner is coming. And so the dog started salivating even before any dinner was in the space. So I took that um, framework and I applied it onto my plants and I used um, pea plants. And just to be clear, these experiment or these kind of question, I had it in my mind for a while. And I tried years before to do it with, um, with a sunflower seed. And, um, and it wasn't working really, or so it seemed, it wasn't working. And then while I was doing some um, deep work with uh, Kokama people in Peru, and I was working with a plant in particular, uh, it was the plant that I was working with that said to me like, oh, and by the way, not, not, not sunflower seedlings, you need to use peas and do this and do that. And he gave me the instruction on how to run the experiment. And so, when I came back home to Australia, I was like, okay, this sounds crazy, but hey, let's, let's do this. And, and I started doing the experiment with the peas, not the sunflowers, just as the plants have said. And, and this is the one that actually ended up really working well. And, uh, and the peas, just like the dog, are able to associate um, the sound. It's not the sound of a bell, but it's the, the, the wind, the, the gentle breeze of a small fan, a computer fan with the arrival of dinner, which for the plant is light. And um, plants do not salivate like the dog would do, <laughs> obviously, but they turn, they're, they're directing their growth, their growth and turn in the direction of the light. But when the experiment is done so that the fan always anticipate the light, the plants are able to turn towards the fan even before any light is presented. So in a way, just like the dog was salivating, predicting the arrival of dinner, the plant is moving, predicting the arrival of light. And, um, and of course, this speaks of the mental and cognitive capacities of plants. And although from, for some of my colleagues, this is still quite heretical and nonsensical, uh, I don't care because uh, I know actually the plants can do much more. And it's just a matter of doing the experiment. If we need, if we want to have the scientific validation of these concepts, in my own experience, which is quite limited, of course, uh, but, and I'm certain in the experience of many indigenous people, th again, these, these questions are kind of like, yeah, of course. I mean, what do you think? <laughs> you know, These are our ancestors. And of course, they, they know. They know what they're doing. They know how to support us. And I mean, just uh, if we don't want to even go that complicated, just the idea that someone like plants can collect the light of the sun and transform it into just like collect light, collect a little bit of uh, carbon dioxide and make sugars and then transform, you know, release the waste and that's oxygen. <laughs> and then here we come and it's like, oh, I'll take that waste. Thank you very much. And we breathe that in. And then, oh, I will eat your sunlight that you transformed into sugar now. And this is how we make our bodies. And what do we do? We release some waste, which is exactly what the plant is going to use to make more of that. It's just uh, if we can see the magic in this, then we are not going to see the magic anywhere. But the magic is there. So it's not that the magic needs to be di discovered. The, we need to be uncovering our eyes and, and, uh, and yeah, reconnect the body to these experiences because it's a very bodily matter uh, question. Yeah. Concordo inteiramente, Mônica. E o que a gente pode... I agree entirely. And based that work and observe in indigenous knowledge, indigenous practices, is precisely this connection between the body and the web of cosmological relations. Jean Paul spoke to us about the importance of the word, but also the nonverbal as well. These intangible dimensions, which are also involved in these interactions with plants, this connection, connection, which we're missing at this moment is to acknowledge and recognize our deep ties with everything around us. 
and I think it would be interesting. I would love to hear more from Jean Paul talking about whether literature is capable of placing us in contact with the nonverbal or indigenous medicine as well. If it reaches these nonverbal dimensions, it's an interesting point in Jean Paul. If you could, we could hear more from you. We're almost running out of time, unfortunately, but we have a few more minutes. If you could give us a little more of a teaser. I was dazzled by what Monica Gaglino said about, and I was reminded, I remember my colleague at the program, Guilherme, it, he's, it's an interesting study as well about plants that he does. But I ask myself and wonder how we can engage in dialogue with the differences in understanding. Monica Gagliano is talking about the scientific understanding, rational research, understanding, etc., that produces science. And we indigenous peoples, we're always talking about based on our conceptions, based on our practices and our relations of what plants are for us. Plants are much more than that. Plants are, for example, I could dare to say, my mother used to say, maniwa is a manioc crop, has a mother. Maniwa, a pepper, has a grandmother, and other plants have their grandmothers. So we they treat them as people, women people who care for that and make that available. These language differences, how can we actually engage in dialogue? Today, I was talking with Carlos Papa, the Guarani leader, about the notion of Nieri, the Atlantic Forest. My, as an indigenous person, it's complex for me to understand what he says. Just imagine our fear also that others who are not part of our world to understand what we are try, trying to say, and we're always saying constantly. That's why I always say that we need to learn to talk and converse and through our differences, not just similarities. We indigenous peoples have been struggling for a long time, talking about the importance of the forest and land and water, the cosmos and knowledge, and oftentimes we are misunderstood, but now science has this new vision which speaks through writing. So for us, plants, in addition to the word that we produce for the political, economic and social relations, that the word has its own life and we need to understand its life, understand the life means to have as an agent in the web of relations as subjects, not as objects. So from our point of view, indigenous point of view, everything has its involved a subject. So the sound of the forest, the sound of the floors, the trees, the swaying of the rustling of the the leaves and the branches, they're all words for a person who can understand, they, they communicate, they know why, and they can understand that sound, what the tree is saying with that noise, what it means, what the leaves mean. There's a, they have their own codes, which we are, forefathers understand we have the dimension of that. It's difficult to explain in words, but we make the effort to explain. And perhaps this time is unique to have this discussion involve the, in the indigenous people, having pe the indigenous peoples in FLIP to uh, speak of our knowledge and theories. This may be an extremely point for us to begin to engage in dialogue in differences. 
I remember Zetulu Krao saying that everything has a song and a sound. And when we hear Zetulu Krao say this, the indigenous leader, we see this deep connection and auditive, auditory abilities and integration, profound integration with everything around to recognize the sound of each thing and everything. It's an extraordinary sensibility. And in fact, science still has a long way to go to acknowledge the complexity of the indigenous knowledge systems, which are far beyond an instrumental perspective to plants and animals. It's now a coincidence that the work by Jean Paul says that the pages, the healers are like cosmopolitical. They transit to these worlds and have a command of these codes. They're capable of not only recognizing these languages, but operate in these languages. This is of an extraordinary beauty and talks to us of the refinement of these knowledge systems. And this is, includes the nonverbal elements because Jean Paul, we're almost out of time, unfortunately. I feel sad. We have to exercise this kind of dialogue more often. It's extremely timely that we have here Monica Gagliano as the ecologist is now dedicated to this line of research and has been disseminating this approach with Jean Paul, who's a representative of a process of the emergence of indigenous intellectuals who are heavily involved here in Latin America as a whole, also in Australia. And we know that it's extremely important for us to occupy these spaces and expand the possibilities for dialogue for us to be able to overcome the difficulties that we still have in acknowledging the possibilities that emerge when we converse and share horizons and experiences and learn the, our mutual sensibilities amongst the peoples. But before we conclude, we're in a literary festival. So I want to have a, one last question for Monica Gagliano. If, what do you think about literature? What's the, your relationship, personal relationship to literature, if literature can help us to reach an understanding and these challenges and also the non-verbal dimensions that still need to be made more visible and understood? Uh, well, I think it is a very powerful, like all of the arts uh, right now, are very powerful ways of um, expressing something that um, words find it difficult. Uh, but that's why we need our artists, the, the, the writers, but also those who paint, the musicians, to give us more ways of expressing this. And uh, again, science has been an important voice. It still is, but it's just one of many voices to express this. And, and I feel like uh, he has dominated a little bit the conversation and yet uh, is maybe we're at a time where it's not necessarily even the best voice to express this. Uh, I, for myself, have engaged with, you know, uh, writing in different ways, uh, both scientifically, but also for a more general audience, so less scientific jargon and more feelings. Uh, and um, yeah, and I, I, in my experience, the, the feedback that I get is always like, uh, there is this sense of relief, you know? People write me emails and it's like, oh, thank you so much because I've always known this and now you wrote it down, so it's okay. <laughs> so in a way, literature could actually give us permission if we ever need it but it is you know a time where we are asking for permission to to be human and uh, and i think literature can allow 
those who are very skilled with those words to bridge that space in between where permission is granted. It was already granted. There was never need to get permission, but the, the words that we can craft can, um, yeah, gives it, they're like a medicine. They can give us that relief so that we can feel, okay, it's okay for me to connect with the world. It's okay for me to, to feel part of a web of life. It's okay for me to be in relationship and collaborating with these non-human other beings uh, that make me uh, all the time and I make them and that's what life is. So yeah, I think that literature in particular and the arts more in general have a very, very important role to play at this time. Thank you. Obrigada, <laughs> Monica. Thank you, Monica. It's a pleasure to hear you. Jean, do you want to say farewell? We're almost, the round table's almost over. Talking about literature, it's a, almost a cosmopolitical language, which has this rigidity of writing of what science. It's a, the literature is a, a language which I can understand when I read literature because it's part of our level of cosmology and understanding and speaking of things. So, as I said, we have this possibility of transgressing and understanding each other. When I say each other as human beings, I'm saying understanding each other and everything around us, not just humans, the land, the forest, the beings, all of this world around us. And doesn't mean to say that we're going to consecrate this and turn this into something untouchable. Our indigenous world, everything is negotiable, but you have to negotiate. That's why the role of our cosmopolitical mediators is essential. In other words, the pages, the pages are essential. They have this role of mediating things, of negotiating. So it's in this sense that literature gives us this relief to read literature. You travel, you connect. It's a trip you know, with your surroundings, with the plants. It's literature, well-written literature makes us, it's an out-of-body experience, tripping in the world. So we're at a good time for us to build the possible path for conviviality and difference. So literature helps us to think, to feel, and transgress and expand our horizons. How great, wonderful to talk with you, Monica Gagliano. It's a huge pleasure, and Jean Paulo. And so our round of conversation comes to a close. It was delicious. And good afternoon. It's early evening for one and all. Thank you. <laughs>